Good afternoon and welcome to our corn and soybean outlook update. I'm Jim Minter, professor and director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture here at Purdue. And joining me today are my colleagues, Dr. Nathan Thompson, who's an assistant professor of the Department of Ag Economics at Purdue, and Michael Langemeyer, who's a professor in Ag Economics and also the associate director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture. So we're going to do a little update with respect to the new information that USDA released this week, the updated world ag supply demand estimates, and also talk about some of the other market developments that have been taking place this week, and there's been many of those. So just taking a quick look at the corn uh, side of things, uh, the changes in the U.S. corn 2020 crop balance sheet. USDA raised the corn export forecast by about 100 million bushels to a total of 2.775 billion bushels. No change in projected feed usage, no change in projected ethanol usage, um, they did wind up reducing the projected carryover then by about 95 million bushels. That brings that carryover down to 1.257 billion bushels. And that's about eight and a half percent of expected usage. So that's a pretty tight carryover compared to history. Uh, they made a small change in the marketing year average corn price for 2020 crop to 435. And again, as we've said in prior months, uh, those numbers look kind of low, but that's because so much of the crop was sold early. And as a result, even though that prices have been much higher recently, difficult to raise that marketing year average very much. Um, this was USDA's first formal presentation of their 2021 crop balance sheet. They gave us kind of a, a glimpse of that back at the USDA Outlook Forum in February. This is the first time they've published it in the World Egg Supply Demand Estimate Report. Uh, they stuck with the uh, projected record high corn yield of 179.5 bushels per acre. That gives you an expected corn production of just under 15 billion bushels. And there's been some talk in the trade. That number um, might be a little higher than some people think, because one of the things that's embedded in that is an estimate of the harvested corn acreage. And USDA did use a maybe a little higher estimate of harvested corn acreage than some other folks are using. So maybe a little bit of debate about that. Um, ethanol usage projected to increase about 5% above the 2020 estimate to 5.2 billion bushels. Um, they pulled back on exports uh, really largely, I think, as a function of an expectation that Brazil would have a more normal crop and have a larger exports next year. Uh, so their projected exports are down about 12% compared to 2020. Uh, that's about 2.45 billion bushels. Um, in the 2021 crop, that would give us an, an ending stocks estimate of about one and a half billion bushels. That's about 11% higher than the 2020 crop uh, estimated ending stocks. Um, if you look at it as a percentage of usage, that would put ending stocks at the end of the 2021 marketing year at about 10% of usage. That's up from about eight and a half percent in 2020. So I would characterize that as kind of a modest improvement or increase in uh, ending stocks, uh, a little less tight supplies than, than what we're experiencing this year. But still, uh, I guess, you know, as I think about it, one of the things that's embedded in that is a record high corn yield. And so it suggests to me that there is still some, some risk out there with respect to whether or not we'll actually hit those targets. And of course, to put that in perspective, if you go back and look at what happened last year with respect to the a production forecast as we move through the course of the year, they change dramatically. So there's still a lot of uncertainty out there with respect to the size of this crop and what that means for ending stocks. On the world side, yeah, USDA did reduce Brazil's um, estimate for their current year production by about 275 million bushels. And they also increased China's expected imports by about 80 million bushels. So if you take a look at ending stocks as a percentage of usage, uh, you know, there's, there's the chart with the history and, you know, it, it just kind of puts it in perspective. We've been talking about this for some time. It starts to put those ending stocks for the 2020 crop really close to where they were in 2011, 2012, actually maybe just a little bit below where we were in 2013, which is the benchmark we've been talking about in prior programs. So a pretty tight ending stock situation um, and, you know, if you look at it on a, on a world basis, uh, those world ending stocks are also pretty tight. I think coming in at about 25% this year and projected to be about 25% next year. Um, that's down from 33% back in the 2016 crop year. And I, and I think as you look at that uh, chart for the world stocks to use ratio, Ed, you might flip to the next slide. 
So if, if you look at that, uh, what you really see is a situation where for an extended period of time, world consumption was exceeding world production. And, you know, they're a little bit of an alleviation of that in, in the 21 crop year, maybe. I think that uh, 2021 um, estimate from USDA for the world ending stocks is, is slightly higher than 2020, but not much. And so really still a lot of risk there with respect to where we're headed on that one. Um, coming into the report, a lot of the focus was on exports. And so if you look at the exports, um, total corn export shipments, and think about them as a percentage of USDA's WASD forecast, um, they're still above the five-year average. Ed, you might flip to the next slide. So if you look at those cumulative exports, uh, we're about 64% of the WASD estimate this year. Um, that's a little bit above uh, the five-year average. I think the five-year average is about 60%. So coming into the report, that looked pretty good. And if you look at what was going on with respect to all destinations versus China, um, total corn exports this year compared to last year up about 78%, uh, with the rise in exports to China alone accounting for about 59% of the increase. And again, Ed, that's on the next slide really leaves a, open a, a question mark there with respect to what China is going to do during the rest of the spring and summer I mean, and what, what impact that might have on our markets. So that was all information on the WASD report. Uh, coming into the report, things were looking pretty positive. Prices were actually up before the report. And then we started getting some more news. And of course, that's on that uh, issue with respect to what's taking place on the Mississippi River. Um, most of you by now are probably aware of what was taking place, or at least have at least some some little bit of knowledge about what's going on down in, in Mississippi. Of course, what happened was uh, the I-40 bridge that crosses the Mississippi near Memphis has been closed uh, because of a major crack in the bridge. And, and Ed, you might go ahead and flip to the next slide. Uh, so river traffic was shut down effective uh, Tuesday afternoon. Um, that spilled over into the marketplace on Wednesday in a big way and yesterday in a big way. That shutdown really brings to a halt uh, the major export outlet for all ag commodities, truthfully, but especially corn and soybeans. Um, you know, if you base it on movement that was going through the lock uh, on the Mississippi side, I think it's Lock and Dam 27. Uh, I think on the Ohio side, it's Lock and Dam 29. If you look at the volume moving through those locks, uh, that's estimated that there's about 29 million bushels of corn and a little over 4 million bushels of soybeans on the river right now in barges just simply waiting to get through um, uh, that, that passageway at, at Memphis. Um, and so the real question mark is how long is that going to be shut down? The bridge is obviously going to be shut down for a long time in terms of getting vehicle traffic back on it. The question mark is how quickly they might reopen it and think it's safe to reopen so that river transportation can can resume. Um, the big impact here is on corn. And the reason is uh, we still got uh, just a little over one third of 2020 crop corn export projections uh, remaining to be shipped. And the bulk of those were going to go through the Port of New Orleans. And so um, that's in my opinion, the big reason why we're seeing a big negative reaction in the corn market this week. I don't think it was really the news so much on the WASD report. There were some, some aspects of that, which, uh, you know, with respect to increasing supplies coming out of, out of the world side that maybe some people didn't expect. So the report wasn't quite as positive as some, some expectations coming in. But the real negative here is what's going on in the Mississippi uh, and, and the inability to move, uh, to move that quantity of corn. Uh, the other big question mark coming in the reports, what's going on in the ethanol world? Um, ethanol margins remain pretty positive. This is based on the ethanol uh, margin data coming out of Iowa State University. And those ethanol margins are still pretty positive. Um, I think as of through last Friday, those were running about positive 14 cents a gallon. Uh, and that's despite the fact that we had these really high corn prices. So that's been a little bit of a surprise and really demonstrates how strong the ethanol market has been recently. Um, if you take a look at ethanol production numbers, um, I've looked at that a couple of different ways. One is to look at it uh, compared to last year. 
And when you look at it that way, we've seen a big rebound here in recent weeks. I think there was uh, one week when ethanol production compared to a year ago was up a 76%. That's really kind of compared to, I think, the low point last year. The last couple of weeks, it's been up about 59% compared to last year. However, it probably makes more sense at this stage because of the pandemic's influence to maybe look at ethanol production compared to 2019. And when you look at it that way, maybe you get a little more, um, a picture that's maybe just a little more clear. Um, and you can see it's a, it's really recovered pretty dramatically here recently, but we're still running seven to 8% below where we were in 2019. So, you know, ethanol production has really rebounded. It's improved a lot in recent weeks. It's improved, especially compared to last year, but we're still running a little bit below uh, year ago or two year ago levels, which maybe could be characterized as a more normal operating environment. And the question mark is, you know, what's going to happen this summer? A lot of news stories here the last couple of weeks about the reopening. And, of course, uh, the announcement this week from CDC suggesting that a lot a lot of uh, U.S. consumers can kind of get back to a more normal uh, behavior this summer. What impact that's going to have on travel? What impact that's going to have on commuting? And what that means for fuel usage is going to be kind of interesting. Uh, and, and whether or not we can get those ethanol numbers back uh, essentially to where they were. Uh, a couple of years ago. So, um, Michael, you took a look at the percentage of corn planted so far in 2021 and made some comparisons using the USDA data, and, and I'll let you talk a little bit about that. Essentially, this is this is quite simple. Uh, 2021 is, is pretty much on track with 2020. Uh, as, of, as of May 9th, week ending May 9th, we had two-thirds of the corn crop planted. Uh, we're, we're obviously ahead of the five-year average because the five-year average would include 2019, where we had a lot of late planting, particularly in the Eastern Corn Belt. So to me, if you look at it and, and also look on the soybean side, Michael. The uh, soybeans is the same story. Uh, we're pretty much on track with, with 2020 and running considerably ahead of what we were uh, in terms of the five-year average. So to me, this was interesting because of the corn planting intentions in particular, because as you think about what's going on with corn planting and especially maybe the drought considerations, which I think I, I maybe got those those maps out of order, but uh, we've got a couple of drought maps coming up here. If you look at where the corn a big increase was, it was in the Dakotas, right? And if you I'm going to fast forward here. If we go to the drought monitor, uh, that first drought monitor chart, uh, you might talk a little bit about that. Yeah, we're, we've got a chart for both May 4th and May 11th. Uh, May 11th is, is slightly different, particularly in the Eastern Corn Belt. And so we wanted to show both of those. But but as you were saying, Jim, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, drought uh, in North and South Dakota. And and, and as, you, as you were saying, uh, that's where we've expected some large increases in corn production. And again, the reason I kind of thought that was interesting is because we're still projecting record high corn yields. Now that 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 is a trend number. I realize that that's the, got the technology component embedded in it, but nevertheless, at 179.5 bushels per acre, uh, with a big chunk of those corn acres coming in in a region that looks uh, somewhat risky going in, uh, that makes you wonder whether or not we're going to be able to hit that target, right? And another concern is, is Northwest Iowa continues to be uh, abnormally dry. Uh, it, it's not in it's it's not in the in fact it's not in the abnormally dry. It's actually in the uh, uh, minor drought or or uh, in in the drought category. And so that that's also an area of concern is the entire part of Northwest Iowa. Yeah. Now, as you look at the drought map, the second one in particular, that May 11th one, you know, you can see that there were some concerns about the Eastern Corn Belt. Um, that largely got alleviated. They're still a little bit showing up here on the map, but most of, uh, for example, Indiana, Eastern Illinois picked up some moisture this week. At least in the short run, uh, things are looking pretty good in the Eastern Corn Belt, right? Yes, and and and, and we've got we've got quite a bit of, of rain forecasted for uh, for Indiana next week, and and so if, if that materializes, we're gonna uh, we're not gonna be uh, dry anytime soon. Yeah, so the concern and the focus is really going to continue to be on that northwest part of the Corn Belt, especially the Dakotas, and, and as you point out, maybe it's spilling over into parts of Iowa. Um, Nathan, you've taken a look at uh, corn basis, and uh, that first corn basis chart for central Indiana, that looks a little wild. What's going on? 
Yeah, so we're looking at uh, basis for corn basis for central Indiana. Uh, and so this is from the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture crop basis tool, which is available on the center's website. Uh, and so we've got two lines here. So the blue line is the historical uh, three year average uh, for central Indiana. And the black line represents the kind of current year's basis. So 2020, 2021 uh, basis again for central Indiana. And so uh, I just wanted to take a minute. So the the, um, the tool, if you go to the website, defaults to the nearby basis, uh, which is the chart that we're looking at here. And so I wanted to give a little bit of an explanation for what we're seeing here with this big dip uh, there in the last week of April and then kind of recovering here in the first week of May uh, and, and kind of understand some of the mechanics of, of what's happening there and then think a little more practically about what that means um, uh, for basis going forward. So we see this big dip and what really is happening, there's, there's kind of two things going on here. The first thing on the next slide, I have um, a snapshot of <clears throat> both the uh, May 21 and July 21 corn futures kind of side by side, just over the past six weeks or so. And what you can see is that right there towards the end of April, uh, as the May contract is kind of nearing uh, its expiration there in the first couple of weeks of May, the, the uh, May 21 corn futures increase uh, faster than, than the July 21 corn futures. So the nearby was increasing uh, quicker than, than that deferred uh, July 21 corn futures contract. And so essentially what happens uh, there is um, as uh, those May 21, the nearby um, corn futures contract was increasing so quickly, uh, cash prices just didn't keep up, right? And so um, there towards the end of April, we saw um, May corn futures increase like 60 cents uh, week over week uh, that last week in April, uh, but cash prices only went up about 40 cents. And so, you know, if you do the math there, that means that basis had to decrease uh, 20 cents, which on the chart shows up as this kind of big dip. However, uh, when you look at, at the chart, you know, basis recovered and bounced back up pretty quickly. And again, when you're looking at nearby basis, part of the reason for that big uh, bounce back up was not only had we seen this dip uh, from this kind of difference or, or, or separation of the nearby and the, the more deferred futures, but then we rolled uh, to that July uh, futures contract being kind of the front month on the nearby chart that, that we started with. And so, you know, we have kind of several things happening there in the mechanics that kind of caused this big dip. But if you look at the chart that's on the screen right now, so this is a uh, corn basis again for central Indiana, but instead of looking at it on a nearby basis, so constantly rolling to the, the nearest uh, futures contract month, this is looking strictly throughout the whole crop marketing year relative to just that July 21 corn uh, futures contract. And so when you look at it this way, again, this is the same data just presented uh, in a different way, only comparing to that July futures contract. We don't see that big dip. And again, the reason was the cash price increase that we were seeing kept up with, with the increase that we saw in July futures. Uh, but again, that, that May uh, corn futures contract right there at the end of the April, at the end of April, uh, was just increasing at a much more rapid pace, which caused the, the dip in basis. So if you look at this July, um, contract basis. Again, we've seen steady improvements throughout the, the crop marketing year. We've continually been above that three-year average. So the black line is above the blue line. And you can see I put in a, a, a note there. I mean, we're 40 cents uh, above where the, the three-year average would say that, that we should be for this time of year based uh, if we use that as our forecast. Now, what we've been saying uh, for, for several months now is we know that the, the supply conditions uh, are, are tighter than they've been in the last several years, which would, would give some reason to think that basis might be different. And so on the next slide, I have um, a basis, again, for central Indiana. Uh, but this time, instead of looking at the last three years as kind of the, the historical uh, average that I'm looking at, the blue line here represents the average of the 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013 harvest year. So I took four years um, where we had maybe similar uh, supply conditions in, in charted kind of current year's basis relative to that. And so again, we've been looking at this chart 
the last couple of months. And again, you can see the big dip here because again, I've gone back to the nearby chart to give context uh, to some of these numbers. But you can see that even though we did dip down there at the end of May because of um, uh, the reasons that I just explained, we bounced back and, and we're up to right about where you know that blue line was um, in, in those previous years. So about 25 cents or so. And you can see, you know, if you look even fo more forward into the future, the potential, I, I'm not saying that this is exactly where we'll be, but, you know, there is some upside basis potential here as we think about, again, continued uh, tight supply conditions. The other thing, again, you know, I, when you do these sorts of like historical um, uh, scenarios and pull out these years that are similar, you have to be a little bit careful. We know that there are some exceptional years in there. So on the next slide, I just pulled out 2011 and 2012, given the drought and the impact that that had on those on basis in those two years specifically, and just looked at uh, the, the 2010 and the 2013 harvest years, what a basis look like, because again, we were still in similar uh, supply condition scenarios. And again, you can see that, uh, again, relative to, to basis in those two, the average of those two years, you know, we're, we're well above uh, where we were at this point in the year uh, for those two years, but still potentially, um, you know, a, a little bit of upside there as we're moving towards 25, 30 cents over uh, nearby futures uh, for those basis levels. So again, the point in going through this exercise is one, to kind of understand if, if you go to the tool, what is that big dip that we see um, you know, right at the end of April? And then two, to think about, all right, well, where are we going from here as we think about uh, the remainder of, of this crop marketing year from a basis perspective? And again, not surprisingly, like we've been saying for a while, there, there are certainly um, conditions that are, are conducive to, to very favorable basis opportunities. Uh, again, we're at a point in the year where, uh, based on the research that, that we've done uh, here at Purdue, there's a lot of volatility in basis, right? So uh, it could be really positive. It could also uh, swing the other way, depending on, on what happens uh, with new crop conditions and things of that nature. Um, but you know, there certainly are opportunities for, for uh, positive basis plays here uh, in the summer months if you're willing to take on the risk. So, Nathan, uh, just for a little clarity here, the basis tool is always based on cash prices that are posted on Wednesdays, right? Correct. So this week has been a crazy week. <laughs> I know you were looking at some of that again here a little bit this morning. Uh, what were you picking up? relative to a couple of days ago? Yeah, so the, the big thing, it, like you mentioned, was uh, the, the river market and, and uh, the shutdown there of the, the bridge. Uh, and so uh, basically, if you look, uh, I, I didn't throw a slide in, I should have. If you look at basis um, there along the, the uh, kind of southern part of, of the, the states that we cover, so southern Illinois, uh, southern Indiana, you definitely see a, a tick down in basis. And, uh, you know, I would have to presume that that's largely associated with, with the, the bridge issues down there. And so um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think I was looking over kind of in, in southwest Illinois, kind of getting really close to that situation. And uh, I think we saw corn basis drop about 20 cents uh, from where it was last week, where it, where it, where it's moved within the week, I don't know for sure because again, I'm looking week over week in the tool itself. But week over week basis was um, down 20 cents. And again, you know, we, we've seen uh, some big moves in the futures market uh, during that time frame as well. But I think a lot of that you know downturn in basis that we're seeing at least along those river markets is certainly being impacted by what's going on in the river. Yeah, so some potential in those in those river markets, the export market heavily dominated by export uh, markets kind of a double whammy with the collapse in futures that's taken place these last few days, compounded by a weakening in the basis. And, uh, you know, if, if we see the bridge reopen quickly, my expectation is we'll see those basis levels recover and probably see some recovery in futures, but it's, it's very iffy in terms of how quickly that bridge might reopen and, and our ability to, uh, to meet those export targets. You've also taken a look at the uh, ethanol plant basis, which I think is very interesting. Yeah, so kind of, you know, um, building off of, of the, the production and the margins data that you went through just a few minutes ago, we, we've been looking at this uh, historical, um, well, historical and contemporaneous uh, ethanol plant basis here in Indiana 
for, for most of this year. And it's been interesting to track given uh, kind of what's been going on, but uh, th there's kind of a lot here. And, and so I'll, I'll move through it quickly, um, but I kind of separated it out just um, because there's a lot that's happened from kind of a, both the supply and the demand uh, situation as it relates to ethanol uh, over the last several years. So the green line is 2018, 2019 ethanol plant basis. Again, tracked along pretty normally until we get to, um, you know, uh, spring of, of 2019 there towards the right hand side of the chart, we see basis jump, right? And so that's basically the planning uh, issues that we had in the spring of 2019 because of uh, wet planting conditions. Basis got really hot, in particular, ethanol plants were, were having to get their hands on corn, and, and that caused a really positive basis situation. Moved to 2019 2020. So that's the red line. Started out with, with pretty favorable basis uh, from the beginning of the year moving forward, but then we get to March of 2020 and we see this big dip in the red line. Again, that's um, the, the COVID pandemic, uh, the huge reduction in the demand for gasoline and thus um, huge reduction in ethanol. And so that had a big negative impact on obviously on ethanol plant basis. Uh, and then the blue line that kind of runs right through the middle there is, is the 15 through 17 average. So something maybe a little more normal would be how I would describe it. And, and maybe something that we would think uh, we would be looking for in, in a normal year. And then the black line finally is, is what's happened this year. So 2020 started out really near that blue line, near that historical 15 to 17 average. But since about the turn of the year, so January 2021, Ethanol plant basis has really been ramping up. And again, that lines up pretty well with what you showed um, from both a production and a margin standpoint, as they've been really competitive in bidding for corn, uh, as they've continued to ramp production back up from, from uh, 2020 uh, when they were, were kind of off because of, of the pandemic. And again, those positive margins has given them the ability to continue to bid competitively for corn. So since the beginning of the year, that ethanol uh, plant basis has been up about 37 cents compared to where it was. And, you know, if we continue to see some improvement in gasoline usage and gasoline demand around the nation, that suggests those margins are probably going to stay positive enough to keep that ethanol basis well supported. Uh, at least that'd be my guess at this point. Um, so you've also taken a look at new crop pricing opportunities. And, you know, we have to have a caveat here. How many minutes ago did you grab that futures price? So I, I think that this was maybe around 11 o'clock today, which is Friday. Uh, so these are relatively recent, but again, you know, this week we've just been all over the place. Up it matters down. minute by minute, doesn't it? <laughs> it really does. And so I tried to get them as close to when we're recording this, but again, uh, depending on when folks are listening, you know, it could be a completely different story. But this this is, you know, probably a pretty good, um, I, I think that we're, we're maybe settled a little bit compared to the last couple of days where we've just been up and down. But uh, just wanting folks to think about new crop opportunities. And again, we've been saying this for a while and obviously uh, relative to maybe where we were two days ago, the market has pulled back quite a bit, uh, but I don't think that that's necessarily changed the need for people to at least be thinking about it. Michael's gonna show us some of his income projections uh, in a little bit. And again, those are just all the more reason to be thinking about why you might need to be uh, getting serious about um, uh, making some new crop moves. So as where we sit, you know, today, uh, Friday morning, uh, new crop December 21 corn futures are around $5.55. Using the crop basis tool, I'm kind of projecting out a, an expected basis in central Indiana at harvest of about 15 cents under, which would put us at a cash price of $5.40. And again, that, that's, you know, obviously lower than where we're at on old crop prices. Um, so you can't can't get too tied up in, in you know, the $7 cash bid that you're seeing today. We're, we're talking about new crop here. The other thing you got to keep in mind here is uh, I know that this is, you know, lower than what it was two or three days ago, but we're still looking at very profitable prices. And so if you haven't done anything, you know, it may not feel like the best time, but you need to at least be thinking about it, maybe setting some targets of what you do want to accomplish. Uh, if we do get some more upward movements, uh, that would give you a chance to pull the trigger on that. But, you know, M Michael will show the numbers later that will maybe uh, solidify this a little bit more in your mind from an income perspective. But these are still very favorable, uh, well above break even prices for most folks. Yeah, that's that's really the key. <clears throat> so 
You've also done some research. I'm thinking back to the research you did on marketing strategies with uh, uh, Aaron, your graduate student. And uh, I'm looking at the July corn futures chart, uh, which has obviously broken off pretty hard these last, really these last three days. Um, you know, we were, uh, what, 735, 740, I think, on July futures. And, you know, now we're down. Uh, I, when I pulled this chart off, I have to give the timeline on that. I think it was about 1130 this morning. So <laughs> <clears throat> um, it was about 655 or so. And um, that break and the timing of the break kind of coincides with some of the research that you did in terms of suggesting a marketing strategy. So you might elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. So as you think about new crop marketing, uh, especially as it relates to, you know, pre-harvest marketing using, <laughs> using futures, um, the research that we did, and again, this, this isn't um, novel, so to speak. I mean, there's, there's lots of folks that have put together these charts, but just looking at seasonality, so to speak, in futures, uh, we tend to see in, in the majority of years, uh, futures hit their peaks sometime in the May, June, July timeframe, depending on crop and contract that you're looking at. But for corn, you know, right now in this middle of May to beginning of June timeframe is, is historically when we have seen uh, new crop corn futures hit their peaks. Uh, and so, you know, if you're looking at making some sales, obviously, you know, you're not going to just make one sale and, and put all your eggs in that basket. You'd want to be spreading it out, but now would be about the time you'd be doing that. And again, if you had been doing that, obviously it's looking like that was a good decision, you know, three, four or five days ago. Um, but even still, we're, we're at that point in the year where that's uh, a time of year when we expect to see uh, the market put in a high. And again, uh, a lot of that has to do with the uncertainty as we're transitioning between old crop and new crop and uh, you know, what's going on in South America, all these different things kind of coalesce right about this time of year where we see the market give us some some opportunities for a weather rally. And so this would definitely be the time frame uh, that, that people should be thinking about. And again, uh, at least looking into and, and considering an option uh, to uh, make a move on some new crop. Yeah, I mean, you have to ask the question based on history, whether or not we have, in fact, put the top in and, you know, obviously an expectation of seeing that bridge reopen at least for river traffic and seeing uh, export channels open up again uh, but nevertheless if you look at it from a historical perspective the odds of this being a top in corn um, from a historical perspective uh, could be pretty high really right yeah so the last thing you took a look at is a tool that's available on the farm doc site over in university of illinois and it's one that we kind of use uh, actually pretty often although we haven't talked about it in these webinars um, you might explain the, how that tool works. Yeah, so on the next slide here, we have um, uh, the, the FarmDoc uh, team has a, a price discovery or futures price distribution tool. Uh, and they, they wrote a really nice uh, FarmDoc daily article earlier this week that I would encourage folks to go check out and kind of what prompted me to, to start thinking in this framework. But uh, basically, the, the point of the tool is, is it uses uh, options prices, so options on futures. It uses options prices, current options prices, to generate a distribution of what new crop futures could be at expiration, right? And so uh, based on what those options are trading for, that gives a measure of volatility, how much risk, and, and kind of sets the kind of range on, on that distribution of what that new crop contract could expire at uh, at harvest in the fall. And so um, what, it's, what it's useful for, what really stuck out to me as I was reading the article and kind of thinking about it is this idea of, you know, we've been encouraging folks to be thinking about new crop opportunities. We, we just did that in the last couple of slides and thinking about, um, you know, where, where current new crop futures prices are at. And, and a lot of times, one of the things that I think people maybe uh, take for granted or don't realize is, you know, yeah, prices are great right now and that's good, but there is still downside risk in the market. And so the whole point of the tool is that it gives you an idea or gives you some quantification of kind of what side of upside, what kind of upside and downside risk might be in the market based on uh, what the, the information the market's telling us. And so what you're looking at here is just a distribution uh, along the, the horizontal axis there is futures prices. So that is the price that the, uh, uh, December 21 new crop corn futures contract could expire at. So again, in, in the fall. 
And then on, on the vertical axis, you know, if you go up from a particular price and then go over, you get the probability that the expiration will be below that price. So if you look at the shaded region on the chart there, the, the price is somewhere around $5.30. If you go up and then over and to the, um, the vertical axis where it hits the purple line there, you know, you'd be somewhere at about 45, 50%. So that there would be a 50% chance that the price would be below $5 and 30 uh, cents. So what I was thinking was, again, if, if we're thinking about this um, uh, new crop uh, marketing opportunities, making some, some moves on some new crop, you know, if we're, if we're in this ballpark of $5 and, and 50 cents or so right now, um, what are the chances that that goes down by say a dollar? And so when I plug that into the tool, it tells me there's a 27% chance that December 21 corn futures are going to decline more than a dollar between now and expiration. So that's useful information, I think, for producers to be thinking about, you know, if you're in this position of, of thinking about whether or not you really want to make a move. So th there is a considerable chance, more than, than one in four, that those futures are going to decline more than a dollar between now and expiration. The, the other thing to do is put that into some historical context, right? So in, in a normal year, uh, what is the chances uh, that futures would decline that much between now uh, and expiration? And so if you look at the historical data, so the, the move of new crop corn, uh, December, 20, uh, December, new crop December corn futures, just regardless of year, the change from, from May to say October in the fall, uh, the the chances of seeing a 1% decline based on that, uh, excuse me, a $1 decrease uh, based on that historical data is uh, really three out of the last 36 years, we've seen a bigger than a $1 uh, decline. And so that's really only about 8%. So basically the, the options prices, the information in the market today is telling us there's a lot more risk upside and downside. Uh, than there is historically, right? So typically we'd say there's about an 8% chance of that big of a move down. And I'm telling you based on the tool, the, the, the farm docs uh, price distribution tool, there's a 27% chance of a decrease of more than a dollar. So anyways, just give some quantification both in a probability sense and then a relative sense of where we are today in today's market uh, of what that risk really looks like and, and what the chances of it going down and how much it yeah, it's a nice way Nathan, of quantifying someone that, that. that's really worried about downside risk, I think it's important to note that there's a 25%, 26% chance that futures price is going to be below 450. Yeah. Just that for basis, that starts to get awful close to the break even. And so, uh, and so I, uh, people really need to think about some marketing strategies now uh, and, and rather than later. Good point. All right, so let's kind of shift gears here a little bit and talk about soybeans. Um, referring back again to the USDA's uh, WASDE report, no changes really in the soybean 2020 crop balance sheet. They left the carryover at 120 million bushels. That's equal to about 2.6% of usage. I think a lot of people in the trade would argue that that's as tight as you can go. Those are really pipeline supplies. You really can't push that carryover below that 120. Um, so the projected soybean price for the year, for the marketing year, still 11.25. And as we said with corn, even though prices have been substantially higher than that recently, since so much of the crop was marketed earlier, it's kind of hard to push that marketing year average up since it's volume weighted. Um, like corn, this was the first formal publication of a 2021 crop balance sheet. Uh, projected soybean yield, they're using 50.8 bushels per acre. I think that's the same number they tossed out at the uh, uh, Ag Outlook Forum back in February. Um, that gave them a 4.4 billion bushel crop estimate for the 2021 crop. That's about 7% larger than in 2020. Uh, small projected increase in soybean crush up about 2% to 2.225 billion bushels. Exports, they pulled back again. I think this is an expectation of seeing more volume coming out of South America in the 2021 uh, crop year. So that's just a little over 2 billion bushels. That's about 9% below where we're at on the 2020 crop. Um, that gives a very small bump in the ending stocks to 140 million bushels. That's only 20 million bushels higher than in 2020. Um, 
And if you look at it as a percentage of usage, that would imply ending stocks that are right around 3% of usage up just a little bit from the 2.6% in 2020. So if you want to characterize that overall, what that really says is soybean supplies remaining very tight in the 2021 marketing year uh, based on current supply estimates, based on current uh, uh, demand estimates. Uh, soybean marketing year average price of 1385. That's a lot higher than this year. And it's just reflecting the fact that uh, those early sales are going to be uh, at higher prices than what took place in the 2020 crop year. On the world side, uh, they did raise Brazil's uh, soybean harvest uh, in the current year by about 74 million bushels. Uh, I think that was 2 million metric tons. Um, that one's been bouncing back and forth with concerns about dry weather in Brazil. And, uh, you know, the, the consensus appears to be that the dry weather has had much more impact on Brazil's second corn crop than it has had on the soybean crop. Um, if you look at our exports, uh, soybean exports to China, uh, the export pace has slowed down this spring, but total exports are still up about 65% compared to 2019. Uh, with a big chunk of those coming out of China. Um, and, and so as you look at it in terms of a percentage of the WASD total, um, as of last week, we've exported a, a, about 91% of what USDA is projecting for the marketing year. Um, that soybean export pace has really slowed down in the last few weeks on a seasonal basis as uh, the soybean export attention has really shifted to South America. And of course, now we've got the wild card with respect to what's going on in the river. Still looks like a pretty good chance we'll be able to hit that export target, assuming the river is able to open back up in some reasonable time frame. Um, if you look at the ending stocks, I think it's useful just to look at that graphically to think about what that implies. With two years in a row at that roughly two and a half to three percent range, you know that's that's virtually unheard of looking at his, history. Back in 2013, we had an ending stock uh, percentage of usage of about 2.6%, essentially matching up with what we have uh, on the 2020 crop. But on both sides of that, we had larger uh, ending stocks as a percentage of usage. So the idea that we basically hold ending stocks essentially constant or very nearly constant off across two years is, is very, very, very unusual and suggests a continued uh, strong support for soybean prices on a longer term basis. If you look at the world levels, world soybean stock levels, um, a little bit like corn, um, influenced a little bit more by the trade war with, with China than, than corn was. But, you know, ending stocks as a percentage of usage were at 33% coming out of the 2018 crop, dropped 27% in the 19 crop year, the 2020 crop year dropped to 23%. And then you know, USDA is projecting just a very, very small increase in world soybean stock levels relative to usage of pushing it up just 1% to 24%. So from a historical standpoint, again, that puts us back in, a, in the ballpark of where we were in the 2012, 2013, um, uh, 2014 crop years. Um, so a pretty tight soybean supply situation, not only in the US, but on a worldwide basis. And that continues through this year uh, with current acreage forecast and with current uh, projections on yield and a, a little difference on soybeans with respect to yield that 50.8 is a re reasonably high yield estimate that's a trend estimate that is not record high unlike corn that is not a record level we did have higher uh, soybean yields in the past once or twice uh, so not quite as optimistic maybe in that standpoint as what we're seeing on the corn side so nathan you've taken a look at the basis uh, information on the soybean side as well yeah, so uh, looking at uh, the next slide here, we have soybean basis in central Indiana. Uh, again, we have the same kind of story here that we had for corn with this big dip uh, in basis at the end of uh, April there. And again, the reasonings are the same, so I'm not going to go through all of them again. But again, we had nearby uh, futures increasing faster than, than the, uh, July, the more deferred futures there causing kind of this uh, dip in basis, but probably a more useful way to look at it on the next slide is again, just going straight to that deferred basis, looking straight into the July throughout the entire crop marketing year, uh, gives us a, a little bit better idea there of what's been going on with basis. And really what we've seen with soybean basis is it's been almost flat uh, here for the last month or so. Um, but again, 
given what we've seen in futures, um, flat basis um, is, is actually pretty positive in the sense that cash prices have been able to keep up uh, with futures here over the last month or so. Again, it's really important to kind of realize and pay attention to the fact that I mean, we've had strong basis throughout the entire crop marketing year. And the charts on the basis tool sometimes can be a little deceiving. So I, I would I would encourage folks to make sure you take time to, to look at the scale. The, it rescales every time you create a chart, uh, just for kind of uh, cosmetic reasons, I guess. But you know, it doesn't look like there's a big gap there, but, but notice that uh, current basis is 78 cents higher than that two-year average, right? And that's a huge, huge difference. And so uh, make sure you're, you're kind of thinking and um, uh, appreciating, I guess, the difference that we're seeing there. And so again, that lends itself to kind of the exercise of, all right, well, we know the last two years have, have been much different than what we've been seeing this year. And so if we compare um, this year with a, a historical year uh, with comparable uh, supply situation, which is what we see here. For soybeans, I just pick out straight the, the 2013 harvest year. That's the last time we've had um, uh, stocks to use anywhere near where we're currently at. And so again, you can see, you know, we're, we're back at looking at this on a nearby uh, basis uh, point of view. With, with uh, the, the dip that we saw there at the end of, of April excluded, we've kind of rebounded uh, as we rolled to uh, the July futures being kind of the front month there. We're right at or above uh, kind of where we were in 2013. So right, you know, 35, 36 cents or so um, on current basis levels there in central Indiana. And again, you can see as you look further out into the summer months, um, some potential targets uh, if you're thinking about or, you, you know, you're, you're one of those folks that's wanting to gamble on some soybeans here for the, the rest of the summer, you know, 75 cents out there in July and then obviously, you know, well over a dollar really late into the marketing year. Again, you've got to be really careful. Uh, we've been saying this all year as it relates to kind of the, the basis play here. Obviously, we're in a tight supply situation. There are going to be people who need soybeans. History tells us that that could create conditions for, you know, um, basis that's just really, really uh, favorable. But again, based on our research, that's a very risky play. Uh, predicting basis uh, from this point forward in the marketing year is very difficult. There's a lot of risk in that. And so, uh, again, the strategy here would be someone who has uh, taken a calculated risk. You know, you understand what you're doing. You understand the upside and the downside. Uh, and, you know, maybe you have a small portion of that old crop that you're hanging on to looking for a, a really big home run, I think is sometimes the term that we use, right? You're, you're really looking to hit a home run there, but uh, take, take in consideration the downside risk that's going to be there as well. Yeah, and so Nathan, you've also taken a look at, like you did on corn at, at new crop pricing opportunities, which, you know, again, don't look as favorable as they did about three or four days ago, but still not, not uh, really a little different scenario than what's taking place in corn. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Yeah, you know, again, it, you got to be really careful, you know, day to day, it seems like things are much different. But again, these are from this morning. Uh, and so we're looking at uh, November 21 soybean futures at about 14, $14.05 a bushel. Uh, from the basis tool, I pulled out a uh, expected uh, basis for, for fall of this year in central Indiana of 30, 30 cents under, which puts you at uh, a $13.75 cash price. And again, not, not as favorable, maybe it was uh, a couple of days ago, uh, but still a, a very um, reasonable price, still a price that's above a lot of people's uh, break even. And so, you know, the chance to lock in uh, some, some profit uh, from a price perspective, um, could, could is something that people need to be uh, taking serious and, and really thinking about uh, as we think about uh, taking advantage of, of what we're seeing going on right now from, from a price perspective. Michael, you usually like to chime in at this point when you talk about profitability. <laughs> yeah, this is certainly way above break even. I mean, the break even for soybeans for, for the West Central Indiana case farm that I'm going to be talking about uh, is below $10. And, and so you're looking at some extremely good margins right now uh, for 21 into 22. I'll talk a little bit about 22 uh, net income uh, projections here in, in a couple minutes. Okay. Let's take a quick look at the uh, futures charts. And again, I pulled these off, I think, roughly 1130 this morning. Um, so these don't represent Friday's close, but they do represent the morning trade. 
And it is a little different scenario than what we saw in the corn side. And I think that's reflective of the difference. Um, first of all, I think coming in before the river closure hit, there were already a few concerns about whether or not we would be able to hit the export targets that uh, were embedded in the WASDE report, just from a logistical standpoint. So um, I was relatively optimistic, but I know there were some concerns in the trade about that. And then you have the river closure, and that has really brought those to the forefront of those concerns. So on the soybean side, since we've already hit over 90% of our target for the year, there's much less concern. And as a result, we're not seeing the downward pressure on soybeans. Um, and that coupled with the fact that the soybean carryover is so tight and projected to remain very tight into the 2021 crop year. So we're not seeing the, the magnitude of the, the impact um, that we saw perhaps on, on, uh, uh, on the corn side, but still not as positive as it was previously. So you have to kind of wonder. And, and Nathan, I think going back to your research, I think your research suggested over time that the peak in corn futures tended to occur a little earlier than on the soybean side, right? That's exactly right. Again, you know, you're, you're looking at a, a maybe, uh, I don't know, eight week window or so where, you know, picking out the, the exact high peak obviously is um, a little bit tricky, but just the general trend was that that peak in the seasonality of soybean futures uh, happens a little bit later than what we see for corn. So if corn is, you know, somewhere between the middle of May and, and beginning of June, uh, I would say that that peak for soybeans, again, from a historical perspective, is most likely to happen maybe more like middle of June to beginning of July. And so, again, based on that research and based on that historical perspective of seasonality, we would expect uh, maybe to see soybeans uh, continue to have a little more strength here. But again, you know, <laughs> there's so many factors influencing things at this point that you know, I'd be careful to say, oh, just hold on because it's gonna it's gonna peak. You know, we, we don't know, um, but that's definitely what the research says. And I think what your research suggests pretty strongly is that you really need to be on your toes this time of year. Yeah. I mean, that, to me, that's the inference. It's like, uh, you know, I, again, falling back on your the research you did, which I really enjoyed, was um, in that fall time frame up through Christmas after harvest, year in and year out, you, you didn't really have to worry about it too much, right? Odds of seeing a, a modest improvement there were very high. Um, that absolutely is not the case this time of year. This is the time of year we need to be paying attention to the markets every single day and, and be ready to take action. Um, so you also took a look at the uh, farm doc dis price discovery tool for soybeans as well to look at those percentage probabilities. Uh, yep, so same idea here. So we're looking at uh, basically the distribution of or the probability of a particular price for the uh, November 21 soybean contract at expiration, right? So we're using current and option prices to, to predict that future distribution. Um, and so when you look at uh, soybeans, again, it's, it's a very similar story where we have a lot more uh, variability in the market this year than maybe we would expect to see historically. And again, I'm not sure that that's necessarily surprising to anyone. But when I went to the tool, uh, again, I did this this morning. So we're looking at basically, uh, the, the probability of soybean prices declining more than $2. So I did a dollar for corn, $2 for soybeans here. So the probability of uh, the soybean current uh, soybean futures prices declining more than $2 between now and expiration is 19%, right? And again, if you compare that with some historical data, so the historical moves of those new crop uh, soybean uh, futures contracts from May to, to expiration, uh, that a move of more than $2 has only happened in, in two of the last 36 years, so like 6% chance. So what normally is about a 6% chance of happening, those option prices, right? The, the market is telling us that there's about a 20% chance that we could see a move that big uh, between now and expiration. So again, this is just reiterating and quantifying the importance of um, thinking about uh, what new crop opportunities are and you know what the downside risk uh, of choosing not to do anything could be. Yeah, I think in, in both cases, the, the way- Break-even price, uh, soybeans is a, is a much different story than corn. 
Uh, as I said before, there's there's about a 25% chance that we could get below people's break even on corn. That's a lot smaller on soybeans. And so I know we need to think about uh, think about some marketing strategies for both corn and soybeans, but it's even more important for corn. Yeah, that's that's a good point, Michael. And in both cases, when you look at the, uh, the, the price declines that you were talking about on both potential declines in both corn and soybeans, um, about three times the probability of what the history over the last 30, I think 36 years is what you said. Yep. Um, that That's kind of instructive, right? That just illustrates the level of risk that's out there this year that we normally perhaps don't don't experience. Yeah, when you have stocks to use at two and a half percent, you're going to have a lot of all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, good point. So, Michael, you've taken a look at some income projections that you've updated based on recent prices, and I think you were kind of working on that even this morning a little bit. Yes, I was. I was working on. I'm using some prices at about 9:30 this morning that were very similar to what uh, Nathan was talking about: 540 corn and 13.75 soybeans. That's essentially what I've used for the the 21 projections. And and uh, uh, 21 net farm income uh, uh, is 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 uh, projected to be for this West Central Indiana case farmer $300 per acre. To put that in perspective, that's higher than what it was in 2010. 2011 or 2012. And so certainly an extremely good year uh, when we're looking at 21. Also, when you compare that to the average since 2007, the average from two, since 2007 is about, about $140. So double uh, the average we've seen since 2007. Of course, net farm income uh, needs to be large enough to cover uh, operator labor, principal payments on machinery buildings and land, and down payments on new purchases. Uh, certainly, it's going to be large enough in 21 for people to perhaps uh, build up their liquidity and uh, look at uh, buying some buying some assets. This is one of the reasons why we're seeing upward pressure on land. Uh, it is this very strong uh, net farm income. Uh, the not so good news is 22. Uh, again, using futures prices at, at mid morning, uh, mid morning this morning, uh, it looks like uh, 22 is going to be about uh, average. So about $140 uh, per acre uh, from net farm income is certainly much, much better than what we saw from 2014 to 2019, but still uh, much lower than what it was in 21. And, and this is a different story than what we saw back uh, in 2010, 2011, 2012. Uh, during the 10 through 12 period, we had three years in a row of very strong net farm income. We're not expecting that uh, to happen uh, this time around. Now, of course, this could all change with very tight stocks to use, uh, 22 could be a lot better uh, than, than what I'm talking about here. I mean, there's a lot of volatility in the market right now, uh, but it doesn't look like we're gonna have a repeat of what we saw in 10, 11, and 12. Next so you also, I, I've ahead, also man. looked at this in a little different way from a, a contribution margin or return over variable cost, uh, net return to land and earnings. And so uh, it, it's similar information as what I've talked about already, but uh, looking at it in a slightly different way. Uh, again, 21, the contribution margin. Uh, this is the margin needed uh, to make uh, cash rent payments, to uh, uh, to support labor, to pay uh, pay labor, both hired and operator, and to, uh, uh, to, to cover the ownership costs of machinery. Uh, and, and we're looking at a contribution margin over $500 in 21 higher than what we saw in 10, 11, 12, uh, which was more like 450 to 475 uh, for those years. Uh, net return to land, I'm gonna talk about that here in a little bit more um, uh, in a second, but the net return to land for 21, over $400. That's well above cash rent in 21. So again, the upward pressure on both cash rents uh, and land. Uh, finally, I wanna talk, uh, talk about earnings or economic profit. This is what's left after we cover all cash costs and opportunity costs. And so we're paying, uh, we're paying our own land, uh, a cash rent where we are, uh, uh, we're paying our, our own machinery, the machinery that we own outright. Uh, we're making an opportunity charge on that. Uh, same with labor and economic profit is, is very, very solid uh, in 2020, 20, 21 and 22. Uh, it wasn't very good from 14 to 19. So certainly a much better situation uh, obviously, uh, in 2021 20, and 22, compared to where we've been uh, from 14 to 19, uh, it's 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 even though it's strong, it's still not quite as good 
uh, as, as that uh, 7 through 12 period. And so uh, that 7 through 12 period was really special uh, in production agriculture, as many of us know. Uh, and that's that's what really built up the large increase in cash rents and land values, the fact that we had several years in a row uh, starting in 2007, uh, where, where net net returns, net, net net farm income per acre was really strong. Uh, so that leads me to the next next uh, slide. Taking a little closer look at the relationship between cash rent uh, and net return to land, very strong in 21, obviously well above uh, projected cash rent. Uh, I've got cash rent going up, uh, uh, you know, at least slightly uh, in 21 and going up more uh, in 22. Uh, 20, 22 looks like we're also above uh, cash rent. Uh, and so the fact that we've looked at, we're looking at three straight years, uh, uh, 2020, 2021 and 2022, where net return to land has been above cash rent uh, is creating a situation that's uh, similar to what we saw in 11 and 12. Uh, in 11 and 12, we had some very large increases in cash rent. Uh, I've got these here uh, as, as a point of reference in 2011, cash rent uh, in real dollars, uh, so adjusted for inflation, went up 14% uh, in West Central Indiana, another 14% in 2012. Uh, so some very strong increases in 11 and 12. And what we're seeing right now is maybe not quite as much strength uh, in cash rent as we saw in 11 and 12, because we don't have quite as many years that were with high net return to land. Uh, we're only looking at three compared to several years uh, in that 2007 to 2000. Uh, 13 period, but nevertheless, uh, we're looking at uh, some uh, some strong enough returns here uh, that we're going to see we're going to see strong upward pressure on cash rents. I would not be surprised in 2022 that uh, the increase in cash rents uh, doesn't doesn't approach 10 percent, uh, given where we're, we're currently looking at uh, in terms of net return to land. Uh, uh, looking for, further on, I mean, for planning purposes, we got to go beyond a year or two. Uh, looking long term. I think we're going to revert to the mean. Uh, if prices revert back to about 450, that's been the average uh, since 2007. 450. Uh, we can't support. Uh, uh, we can't support cash rent that's 275 to 300 dollars. That's what we might be looking at in West Central Indiana in, in 2022. We can't support that long term. And so when you're going into negotiations for the fall of, of 21, keep that in mind. Yes, returns are really strong right now. But but if we revert back to 450 corn, which we might, uh, you know, 23 and, and on, uh, that's what people are expecting, USDA and others, uh, we can't support that 275 to $300 cash rent. So, Michael, as I listen to you talk about that, I guess the thought that comes to mind to me is this idea that uh, if you're entering into a multi-year cash rental arrangement, you need to be pretty careful about how it's structured, right? Yes, very careful how it's structured. We talked about this last time too. Rather than increasing cash rent, think about a flex rent. So if if, if returns are really strong, both parties win. Uh, you know, the operator gets some more money and the landlord gets a bonus. You know, because this because this 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 strong net return to land is probably going to have some legs, but not not beyond 2022, at least the way it looks right now. Think about a flex rent arrangement. That might be very prudent. Uh, one of the final things I want to talk about is how different uh, the, the earnings per acre comparison between corn and soybeans is uh, this month compared to last month. Uh, when we looked at this last month, uh, soybeans had a stronger return than corn by quite a bit. Uh, it, it, uh, in, in 21, it was about $25 per acre uh, in favor of soybeans. Uh, going to the next slide, looking at this from a May standpoint, uh, now that's flipped. Uh, you know, we've seen some relatively strong corn prices and even taking some of the taking some of that out the wind out of those corn prices uh, in the last day or two. Uh, corn is looking like it's going to be more profitable than soybeans uh, in 21. Now, this is rotation corn compared to uh, rotation soybeans. Uh, certainly continuous corn would not look as good uh, as what I'm uh, indicating here, but about a $50 advantage uh, for rotation corn uh, in 21. Uh, looking ahead at 2022, this is no surprise. Uh, we're looking at uh, about the same uh, net return to land. I mean, those prices could change dramatically uh, in the next nine months to make that look different. But right now, we're looking about similar profitability uh, for corn and soybeans. And so, and so, one of the interesting things to me, and I'd like to uh, to get your guys' take on this, um, you know, given how tight 
the soybean stocks are two and a half percent, three percent for the 21 balance sheet. Corn looks really profitable. Uh, we're going to be hard pressed to get those soybean acres up where they probably need to be uh, to really increase that stocks to use ratio rapidly. Uh, and, and I'd just like to get your guys' thought on that. Am I, am I missing something there? We're going to have to pull it from other crops. I mean, that's, and if you look at what took place this spring, that continues to be the puzzle as to why the uh, principal crop acreage didn't rebound stronger than it, than it showed up in the, in the prospective plantings report. So yeah, that's a good about, point. I don't think we can pull from corn. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be the issue. We're going to need to pull from other areas. And uh, that also means that the actual plantings uh, acreage report that comes out at the end of June is going to be very interesting and, and very closely watched to see if, in fact, we did pull in any additional acres this spring, because um, that's still an open question. Um, normally, uh, you know, from history perspective, um, that March report tends to be kind of the baseline. And then if you have weather problems, sometimes you fall short of the planning intentions that are in that March report. It would be unusual to pull in some additional acres in total across those two crops um, on the on the June report, but it's possible. And I think that's what the market's really going to be looking at and see what's happened. So we could see, you know, again, thinking about your research, Nathan, we could see some real volatility around that late June, early July time frame in part because of what's taking place with acreage. Yeah, the corner soybean acreage, either one is below what what the uh, the March uh, planning intentions report was. We're going to see some we're going to see some changes in corn soybean corn or soybean prices. All right, with that, that kind of wraps up our webinar for this afternoon. Um, our next webinar is scheduled for June 11th. That's the day after the June uh, World Ag Supply Demand Estimates. Uh, from USDA, and we'll have the details regarding the webinar available on our website, purdue.edu slash commercial ag. So uh, with that, thanks for joining us this afternoon. On behalf of my colleagues, uh, Michael Langemeyer and Nathan Thompson, I'm Jim Mintert, and on behalf of the Center for Commercial Agriculture, thanks for joining us.